Good evening, everyone. It's been uh, 38 years since I was in Jerusalem, uh, and um, I can tell you it's improved. Uh, everything about this city is, is just wonderful, and uh, I, I, I haven't been anywhere I've enjoyed so much for a very long time, uh, so I won't be leaving it that long again uh, before returning. Um, now, we're talking this evening about modernity, religion, and morality. Uh, those are very general ideas, so we're going to try and make it a bit more specific. Um, and you will have heard, many of you will have participated in the marvelous seminar we've been running this week. Um, so now, I'm going to introduce our two main speakers, probably both of them known to most of you. But anyway, George Weigel is both a Catholic with a capital C and a Catholic with a small c uh, scholar. Uh, a truly transatlantic intellectual, as at home in history and theology as he is in biography and what they used to call the higher journalism. I have reviewed several of his books and I cannot recommend them too highly. This week we've been discussing themes from the cube and the cathedral, which I described, I looked up my old review, uh, when it appeared in 2005 as a sumptuous banquet stuffed with enough ideas for several books. And we look forward to developing his ideas further this evening. Um, Yoram Hazoni is one of Israel's most distinguished political and theological thinkers. His books, especially The Jewish State and most recently The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture, have made a big impact right around the world. Three years ago, I had the honor to chair a fascinating discussion about the Hebrew Bible between Yoram and Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, which I believe you can find on YouTube. It's well worth looking up that discussion too. Here in Jerusalem, Yoram founded the Shalem Center, which has now morphed into Israel's first liberal arts college. And he is also president of the Herzl Institute. So um, the way we're gonna do this, I think, is, is that I shall uh, ask some questions and uh, George and Yoram will discuss with each other, uh, and then we'll throw it open to the floor, maybe around about half past eight or so, and uh, I hope you'll all join in, and uh, we'll have a really good discussion. Our topic this evening um, is kind of uh, 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 Western civilization, all of it. Uh, is it, um, how's it doing? And uh, um, Maybe we'll have a little bit of a debate. I'm going to take the side that it's not doing so great. Um, the uh, reason that I say this is that I understand the West to have been uh, built on uh, to have been built on the Bible, and I'm sure that my uh, my colleagues will come and say, "Well, Yoram, you you know that the West was built on the Bible and on." Plato and Aristotle and what came after that. Um, and I'd actually like to, you know, just in order to be provocative and <clears throat> make the evening more interesting for those of you who, you know, came all this way, uh, to say that actually no, although I, 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 I know plenty about uh, the contributions of Plato and Aristotle, but what we consider to be the West uh, is that world which also um, not only had Plato and Aristotle, but had to have as it, the pillars of it built by, uh, by the Bible and especially by the Hebrew Bible, by the Old Testament. We have, for example, uh, the Islamic world, uh, which had plenty of Plato and Aristotle. There's a tremendous amount of study of Plato and Aristotle in the Islamic world, but the Islamic world did not have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And uh, the divergence between the West and the, 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 and the the, the Middle East is to a significant degree that. Now, I'll, I'll give you a couple of points to back this up, but I want to rush to the end of what it is that I'm going to propose so that you're not guessing. The West was created by the Bible to a very, very significant degree, essentially so. And if you were to take the Bible out of the West, then the West would not only, I believe, cease to be the West, which, you know, so what? It could be something nicer than the West, who cares? But I also believe that it would not survive the ordeal. 
I believe that if you remove the Bible from the West, you, you basically have residual fumes from uh, spirits of the Bible hanging out. And as soon as those are used up, as soon as those are dissipated, then you will not have a West. I want to give you a couple of examples of what it is that I'm, that, that I'm talking about. But first, let's talk about that other crucial component of the West, which is liberalism. Liberalism, the belief that, <clears throat> that society best orders itself, and I believe this too. Society best orders itself when it concerns itself with, first of all, with the, uh, the liberty of the individuals who live in the society. Second, that there be equality before the law and equality of, uh, uh, of fundamental opportunity for the people living in the society. All right, those, are, those are liberal values. I hold those values. But I don't think those values are remotely enough in order to be able to sustain a society. Let's just consider a couple of examples. We have in uh, the Western world today um, uh, an unprecedented crisis of uh, birth rates, of childbirth, child rearing. Sometimes it's called the crisis of the family. Uh, there's other com components of the crisis of the family. But for the moment, let's just talk about this, this one biblical concept, one Old Testament Hebrew Bible concept. Pour vous. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and conquer it and subdue it is the first commandment of the Jewish Bible. To the extent that Christians take the Jewish Bible seriously as part of the Christian Bible, and very frequently it has been taken extremely seriously, then that becomes a commandment also for Christians. And that's a commandment which expresses God's joy in our multiplying. Somebody could say, what does God care if we multiply? He should care about the quality of the, you know, the content of our character, not the number of our children. But the Jewish God cares about the number of our children because he thinks that health and well-being and flourishing and fulfillment depend on each and every one of us trying to do our best to have children. And not just one child or one and a half children or whatever is in the vogue now, but many children to flourish, to multiply. And so long as a society believes in its future, then it invests in having children. Now today we have the most liberal societies that have ever existed, thank God. Wealthiest, healthiest in many ways. But they don't want to have children. In Israel, in Israel we, we are having children. Israel, the, 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 average, the average Jewish woman in Israel has three children and it's going up every year. For 10 years it's been going up. I'm very proud of that. But the entire rest of the Western world is, uh, is, not, is not producing enough children to be able to reproduce itself. That is, if you, if you go to a country like, like Holland or like Germany, England, France, Italy, none of these countries are countries that produce enough children so that they will be able to maintain themselves going into the future. What does that mean? What's happening there? Well, we know, we, we know roughly what's happening. What's happening is that people, uh, people f feel free, people feel equal. We've achieved that, they're free, they're equal. They're the freest, most equal people they've ever been. But they've lost any sort of sense of what it means to have responsibility for the future of their nations, of their religions, of their traditions, of the good in the world. Yes, the good, I said the good. That is, there are some societies and some movements and some, some intellectual ideas and some political movements that are not good. That you, you may have noticed there are some things in the world that are just not good. And if you want to fight the things that are not good and do good in the world, we call that the covenant, the covenant between God and the Jewish people, the covenant between God and all nations that follow in, in alliance with the Jewish people. That covenant is based on the assumption that, that we're here in the world to give God a hand and do some good. And God says to us, well, how are you going to do any good if there aren't any of you, if you're disappearing? You're not going to do any good. Get out there, get married, have kids, and then do some good. You think you can do good without that? Now, this is a very, very simple clash between uh, the, the modern West, which thinks that 
you're okay if you are, you know, fulfilling yourself. And a biblical-based civilization which says you're not okay unless you're doing something in order to make this world something decent and worth living in, not just today, not just by carrying the groceries for the woman across the street or putting on tefillin, but for the next generation and the next and the next. I'll give you a second example. There's an awful lot of talk about immigration. Awful lot of talk about it. I want to try to put a, uh, a slightly different spin on it from what we usually hear in the news. The Hebrew Bible is based on the assumption, when, when I say the Hebrew Bible, I mean virtually the entire corpus of the biblical, biblical texts, and then going on into the Talmud, is based on the assumption that there is such a thing as a nation, that there is such a thing as a people. God, God creates the nations in, in, in Genesis, and from there to the end of time, as far as we know, there are going to be nations. This is the Bible, is, is, it's not a John Lennon, imagine there's no countries, no peoples, no religions, you know, we'll all just become sort of this, this you know, paste of people listening to early 70s uh, pop music. No, 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 no. There are nations because every nation, because, because the truth is complicated. And every nation has its own mission. Every nation has its own contribution. Every nation has its own strengths and its weaknesses. Every nation has something to contribute. And the vision, the Jewish vision, the ultimate vision for peace on earth that we find in the prophets of Israel, that's a vision in which the nations remain. They don't disappear. They don't turn into one thing. There is no one thing human beings are supposed to be. Isaiah tells and teaches us that, that, that Egypt, that in, in, in the coming time, that Egypt is going to worship together with Assyria and Assyria together with Israel. But Egypt is still going to be Egypt. They'll have their own traditions, their own customs, and their own ideas. And Assyria will be the same. The difference between this age and that age is that they will make peace with us, and they will cease to persecute us. And to the extent that we're persecuting them, we'll stop that too in exchange. And, and there'll be peace in the world among different nations, not some kind of universal, everybody's the same, but the opposite. Everybody's different and we'll have peace even though everybody's different. When one day we rebuild that temple on Harbait, on the Temple Mount, it's going to be because we've made peace with our Muslim Arab neighbors. We'll have made peace with them in such a way that it'll be possible to, to build that thing there without causing hatred between us. And then it will become, according to our, our vision, uh, the capstone of, of where all the nations of the world will come and, and, and celebrate together. But you can't celebrate together if there aren't nations. Now why do I say this? Because the idea of a nation as a political ideal is only, it's only a biblical ideal. It does not, you can't, you can't find it in Greek sources and you can't find it in Roman sources. Roman sources are in, interested in imperial things and Greek sources are interested in the city-state. You don't get to the nation in Western political theory outside of the Jewish tradition until you get to Polybius. We're talking about many, many centuries after the Bible. There's no, there's no Western ideal of the nation independent of the place where it's found, and that's the Bible. Where do you find it? You find it in Deuteronomy. You find it uh, where, where, where God says, you're only going to have a king from your own people. You're only going to have a prophet from your own people. You're going to have borders. You think the borders that Israel gets in Deuteronomy are big, but you know what God thinks? God thinks, heck, I'm the first God in the history of the human race to give borders to his own people so that they don't go out and try to conquer the world, because that's evil. And the Western idea of the nation state that, that, comes, that, 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 we, that, that is a cornerstone of modernity, uh, that, that the Irish get their own country, that the, that the Poles get their own country, that the British do not have to be ruled by the Spanish. That's a biblical idea. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a biblical idea that they didn't know was biblical. It's an idea that comes to the fore only when they start reading the Bible in their own languages and they say, wow, this is an incredibly good idea. How about if we have self-determination and rule ourselves, that way we can be free as a nation. The only source of this is in the Jewish Bible. It's a gift that, 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 that the Jewish Bible gives to the world. 
And today, when I see you know, the German chancellor, and she says, one and a half million Middle Easterners um, entering this year into, into my country, no problem. I think she needs to read her Bible. Okay, because of course nations are supposed to help each other, right? We're supposed to be a light to the nations. But a light to the nations doesn't mean that you drown your own country with some other nation until you're extinguished. I apologize if I'm hurting somebody's feelings, but I think we really have to talk about this. Any country that has something to offer, something moral, something good, a culture of its own that's worth sharing with the world, is a country that's worth defending against being swamped by the other countries, the other nations, that it's trying to help. If that's not obvious, then like I say, I think we just need to go back to the Bible. So I've just given you two examples, and, and our time is short, so I'll stop here. But my conclusion is pretty simple. We're the freest and most equal peoples who've ever lived, and it's great. And if we don't have the Bible, then we lose our compass, we don't have families, we don't have nations, we don't have anything other than people who are free. And the answer to the question, free to do what? Well, I don't think there's any answer to that once you've eliminated all the other values. Uh, good evening to everyone. It's a great uh, honor uh, to be here. I want to thank the Tikva Fund for bringing me to uh, Jerusalem for the fourth time. I'm three, uh, two ahead of Daniel here and intend to stay ahead in the uh, future. Uh, it's been a very enjoyable week uh, for me. I want to thank the colleagues in the seminar uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Azzoni and I have evidently been reading each other for 20 years and admiring each other uh, from a distance for two decades, so it's a great pleasure uh, to finally uh, meet. Uh, and initiate what I hope is a great uh, personal friendship as well as intellectual friendship. Let me make five brief points uh, that are more or less connected uh, that I hope will provoke some conversation. Some of this will be repetitive for those who are in the seminar, so I ask their forgiveness ahead of time. Uh, I agree with uh, Yoram that uh, the West means uh, Jerusalem. I would add to it Athens and Rome, uh, by which I mean the civilizational enterprise called the West is built on the biblical notion that life is pilgrimage, journey, adventure, not cyclical, not just one damn thing after another, not randomness and hazard. And in that sense, the exodus really is the foundational uh, metaphor for what the Western world. But to that foundation, Athens added uh, faith in human reason to get at the truth of things, if not completely, then at least substantially, and the Roman conviction that the rule of law uh, is superior to the rule of brute uh, force or coercion. Uh, what I would also say, as I've been trying to explain uh, in the seminar, or propose in the seminar is that Jerusalem is the glue that holds the other two together. Uh, and in that sense, it is utterly foundational for when faith in the God of the Bible, as we've seen since the 19th century in the West, deteriorates, faith in reason itself uh, begins to deteriorate and we end up in the kind of sand pit or the quick sand pit of postmodernism, where there is merely your truth and my truth, but nothing properly describable as the truth, and that of course leads eventually to the erosion of the rule of law, because if there's only your truth and my truth, and neither one of us recognizes something as the truth, we have no horizon or no way of adjudicating uh, the uh, problem between us when your truth comes into conflict with my truth, save my imposing my power on you, or you imposing your power on me. So the West, to my mind, equals a uh, triple-headed, uh, or as I've described in the seminar, a stool with three legs, of which the biblical stool, uh, the biblical leg, is, is the most crucial, because without it, the other two get wobbly and, uh, as I think we're seeing today, uh, begin to collapse. 
Second point I want to just put out for our reflection uh, occurred to me somewhere between dinner and uh, uh, this uh, meeting tonight, and that is it's often thought in the secular world that the, the principal uh, way of thinking about modernity is that modernity equals the scientific method. Modernity equals science. Modernity equals the move away from the tutelage of revealed religion uh, into the tutelage of the scientific method. And it occurred to me that it's worth thinking about the fact that in the two most dramatic uh, developments of, uh, two of the most dramatic developments in the contemporary scientific world in uh, genetics and uh, cosmology, astrophysics, uh, the two crucial ideas were uh, implanted in the West by uh, religious men, indeed Catholic priests. Modern genetics begins with the Austrian monk, Augustinian monk Gregor Mendel. The Big Bang Theory, which dominates cosmology today, begins with the Belgian Jesuit Georges Lemaitre. Why, did that, why was that the case? I suggest it's the case because those men were the inheritors of that fruitful interaction between Jerusalem and Athens. Their confidence that the creator had imprinted a rationality on the world. Indeed, his own rationality is built into the world such that we can know uh, the truth of things led Mendel to create modern genetics and the theory of how traits pass over generations, which is utterly crucial to the new uh, possibilities of biotechnology, and led Lemaitre to uh, his understanding of the origins of what we know as the universe uh, in a way that many of us find quite compatible uh, with the biblical account. So there's a second idea. We, need, we might want to talk about modernity, science, and religion often understood to be antinomies. I think modern science is inconceivable uh, without biblical religion, and it is no accident that modern science emerged in the West, not in Hindu cultures, not in Confucian cultures, uh, not in Buddhist cultures. Uh, it emerged in a culture saturated uh, with the truths of biblical religion. Uh, third point, very briefly, um, there's a lot wrong with the American phrase, the separation of church and state, which has become a kind of all-purpose metaphor for the interaction between religion and society under the conditions of modernity, because this has too frequently been interpreted, not least in the United States, as the utter privatization of religion as a kind of personal lifestyle choice with no real traction in public uh, life. I happen to think the institutional separation of church and state is very good news for the church. Uh, I have no interest in established churches. Uh, I believe uh, the church's entanglement, the Catholic church's entanglement, the Christian church's entanglement with uh, state power in the form of legal establishment was a kind of Babylonian exile from which Christianity is only emerging in recent decades, sometimes by its own means, sometimes by other means. The separation of political authority from the spiritual authority is very good for uh, religious communities, in my view, but it, it has tended to be bad news for the state in two ways. One is, uh, as has increasingly happened in our, my country, if this institutional separation of the institution of religion and um, governance uh, is understood to be uh, one in which the state tolerates, to whatever degree it finds agreeable, the public expression of religious conviction, it seems almost inevitable that religious conviction is driven to the margins of the public uh, discourse, and the net result is what my uh, old friend, the late Father Richard John Newhouse, called the naked public square. Uh, not only a public space shorn of religious conviction, 
but uh, denuded of religiously informed moral conviction. Uh, and we see this more and more uh, in the United States today as the state and the person of the US Supreme Court begins to erect a kind of new religious establishment uh, called by some expressive individualism of which the most recent Supreme Court decision in the matter of who can marry whom was a pluperfect expression. Fourth point, briefly, the moral life, morality, absent the Bible and moral reason, leads to various forms of sentimentality, which lead to various forms of moralism, which lead to things like yesterday's European Union decision that was on the front pages of uh, papers uh, all over this country uh, today. Uh, that was not an exercise in moral judgment or moral reason. It was moralism substituting for moral reason uh, in a, uh, from a continent uh, that is increasingly showing the deleterious effects of what happens when Jerusalem leaves the scene. Athens deteriorates into postmodernism, uh, and the rule of law begins to erode. Finally, and if I haven't offended at least everybody at least once here, maybe this will do it, uh, the secular West is, the secular West in the sense of the Western democratic project, that commitment to civility, tolerance, the protection of human rights, the rule of law, democratic political process, which is the bond that unites uh, Daniel Johnson, citizen of, uh, subject of the crown, uh, whom we got rid of uh, a while ago, uh, and Yoram Hazoni and me and my friends in Australia, et cetera, et cetera, all across the democratic world. That democratic world, and I think Yoram was saying this, although I'll put it in a slightly different way, is ultimately dependent for its survival, certainly for its vitality and perhaps for its survival, on ideas that it largely did not uncover or discover, and on virtues that it finds it increasingly difficult to inculcate, much less live. And therefore, we need, across this brotherhood, if the ladies will permit me, uh, brotherhood of democratic peoples uh, around the world, uh, a new reflection uh, on the moral cultural foundations of the great project of self-governance in which we are uh, engaged. Uh, and we need to do that uh, because absent that, it seems to me we will be increasingly unable to prevent the kind of in internal erosion that simply identifies the telos of life with happy hedonism, uh, and we will not have any principled ground on which to mount a defense uh, of this way of life against those who would threaten it from outside, uh, including most particularly jihadist Islam, uh, but also the recrudescence of various forms of authoritarianism uh, manifest by uh, Vladimir Putin. So, five thoughts to get something started. Thank you very much. I have this, this feeling, this fear that, uh, as George said, we, we've been reading each other for 20 years and uh, admiring one another's work, work certainly I, I, I've learned a tremendous amount. And there is this palpable danger that we're just going to agree on absolutely everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just I, I think just in order to, to, um, to make the evening more pleasurable for the, uh, for the, 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 the people who, who came out tonight, I'd like to disagree on something. Now, I, maybe I won't do a good enough job and then George will just agree with me, but I'll try. I'm gonna try to disagree about something. One small point. Separation of church and state um, in its current American form, um, as, as George made clear, is, is not working. And, um, and the reason that it's not working is because there, 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 there is an 
uh, an institutional, the Supreme Court is the head of it, but it's not the only institution involved. There's this institutional effort to systematically make anything that distinguishes one group of people from another group of people something that only takes place in the privacy of your home or maybe not at all. And uh, um, it's not as though nobody ever thought about this. I mean, the, the idea of, uh, of a public school system where you require by law everyone to send their children, which public school system is then not going to include any instruction whatsoever about uh, scripture or religion or things that are related to scripture and religion, such as you know, uh, the, the things that we've been talking about the, the, this evening. All of those things are going to be, <clears throat> they're going to be relegated to you know, a couple of hours on Sunday. So this was, you know, th th this, this worked for a while. It wasn't until the 1920s that the American Supreme Court um, uh, struck down uh, 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 the, 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 uh, what was then called release time, which is uh, public schools were allowed to teach Jews, Judaism, and, Chris, and, and Catholics, Catholicism, and, and Protestants, Protestantism. 1920s, that was struck down. In the 1960s, we all know that the, the American court struck down um, uh, school prayer, prayer in the schools, uh, voluntary prayer in the schools, too, and, um, and, 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 and Bible reading. It's a little bit more complicated than what I'm saying, but this is roughly the case. Now, we're at the tail end of this. And I don't think there can be any doubt whatsoever that if you force the overwhelming majority of the children in a given country to spend five days a week or six days a week, five or six days a week, studying something that is systematically denuded of the most important texts and the most important values that the society cherishes, it doesn't make any difference what, how good your reasons are. You're going to create a society, ultimately, in the end, you'll create a society that's not capable of understanding what it's defending itself about. And so I think the time has come to, uh, to rethink separation of church and state. Um, the, there is, as uh, uh, George writes in one of his books, um, the, the, there is a separation of church and state tradition within the, the, the Jewish and Christian tradition. I mean, we, we, we all know that, that, uh, uh, that uh, a, a, a king is not allowed to exercise the functions of a Levite, even in the Bible, not, not just in, 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 in the Talmud, it's already in, in uh, Hebrew scripture. There's a division of power between a king and a Levite. There's a division of power between the kings and, 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 uh, and the prophets. And if we trace Christian history throughout the history of Europe, we'll see that in every great contest between, uh, between uh, uh, kings and the church, what was being cited overwhelmingly was these precedents from the Hebrew Bible. As in, the, in the time of Char Charlemagne, there was actually a, a saying that if you want to know how to, how, how, to, uh, how to gain eternal life for the next world, then you read the New Testament. But if you want to understand how to run this world as a king, then you have to read the Old Testament. And that, that sort of slogan actually has a lot to do with what, what happened and the way that the West emerged. But no one at any stage envisioned a separation of church and state of the kind that we're talking about, where the population by force is made to educate its children in what essentially is an alien civilization, a civilization in which the, the Bible has been smashed in terms of its prestige and its public standing so that people don't even notice that it's gone. I, I think we absolutely have to, when we get together for our alliance of, of free uh, nations, I think we need to talk about this first. Let me just respond to that seated, if I may. Um, uh, it's an interesting and often unknown historical fact that the public school system in the United States, what is now the public school system, begins in the 1840s, more or less, with nativist or, frankly, anti-Catholic concerns about the unassimilability of all of these unwashed uh, Irish and Germans and Italians and later Poles and Czechs and Slovaks, uh, wa you know, washing across the Atlantic and washing up uh, in New York Harbor at uh, Ellis Island. Uh, the public school system in the United States was from the beginning a kind of tacit 
Protestant establishment, uh, which in the days when American Protestantism, mainline Protestantism, had some real bottom to it, at least inculcated some basic uh, ideas drawn from both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Uh, but these were really government schools, not public schools. The school in my Catholic parish in suburban Washington has 525 kids in it, of whom I think at least 125 are not from Catholic families. That's a school providing a public service. Um, the hegemony of the term public school for government school is, I think, part of the problem here. And that tacit Protestant establishment has become, in the U.S., uh, I think to a quite intolerable degree, I won't disagree with that, a not so tacit establishment of secularism. Uh, the answer to this, it seems to me, is not complicated. It's to separate funding from delivery. Uh, I believe that uh, a just state provides for the education of its citizenry, and I think that it's a matter of justice for uh, the citizens to support through their taxes uh, the education of future generations. But that funding need not flow directly through schools run by the state. In my judgment, it ought to follow the parents uh, so that through a voucher system or tax credits or whatever mechanism seems to work best, so that children can attend a variety of schools, the society is supporting a genuine pluralism there, uh, and those schools, of course, should have to meet a minimum set of educational standards. Uh, perhaps that's the way it works here. I just don't know how education funding and, and whatnot works uh, in the state of Israel, but I think that's the only way this can work uh, over time in the United States uh, without the state school system. Um, becoming even more an instrument of the moral cultural deracination of society. Well, funnily enough, the, the system that uh, George has just described is actually the one we have in, in Britain, although it's under threat um, because a, a, an aggressively secularist mindset can't understand how their taxes can contribute to um, religious schools, to Catholic or Protestant or Jewish schools. Uh, they, don't, they don't think that's right. And so there is a conflict. But as things stand, we do still do it that way. We do separate the funding from the delivery. Um, I mean, taking that a little bit further, um, surely, George, for, for Christians and Jews living in the United States, religious freedom shouldn't really be an issue. Yet that is what it has happened. It has become an issue, um, not just in schools, but also more widely, thanks to the concatenation of a secularist culture that is intolerant of religious orthodoxy, the radical agenda of the Obama White House, and the focus of the present Supreme Court on equality to the exclusion of all other values. So how should Americans who wish to practice their faith and preserve their principles without breaking the law go about it? Well, I could give people some electoral advice for next year. Uh, this is perhaps not entirely well known here. Max Singer and I were talking about this at uh, dinner tonight. The next president of the United States, because of the uh, <clears throat> this, uh, geriatric character of our Supreme Court, will almost certainly get to nominate two Supreme Court justices, may get to nominate three, and it's not inconceivable that the next president could nominate four. And because the Supreme Court is the principal agent of this establishment of secularism in a very hard-edged form, there is an enormous amount riding on uh, the results of a year from uh, last week. Uh, with a president committed to Supreme Court justices who interpret the written text of the Constitution 
not make things up uh, to satisfy certain public policy uh, aims that uh, they have in their own heads. I think it is possible uh, to reverse uh, at least the framework, the legal framework, uh, in which this um, drive towards the naked public square uh, has been conducted, really since, Europe, as Joram says, since the immediate post-World War II period. Uh, if to get down to cases, there is a democratic president uh, with a sufficient critical mass of Democrats in the Senate to confirm two, three, or four Supreme Court nominees, uh, then this problem is going to be infinitely more difficult uh, to address. And it's going to start uh, hitting not only um, uh, my church, which is already feeling it in the attempt to recruit uh, its healthcare institutions, its social service institutions and its educational institutions as uh, de facto agencies of the federal government for providing certain kinds of, of uh, so-called health care services that we regard as fundamentally wrong. Uh, this will begin to affect the Jewish community as well. And in fact, probably will in any case, although there may be a way with a different kind of Supreme Court, there may be a way to deal with this. I was saying to uh, one of the students uh, at lunch today, I think it is virtually inevitable that in a crazy, crazy, secular, hard left environment like the city in which I used to live for nine years, Seattle, has now found itself, that there will be laws adopted in the next five to ten years banning circumcision and kosher slaughter. Uh, that, that's where it's going to hit immediately uh, in the Jewish community. And if uh, expressive individualism continues to be the dominant um, metaphysic, if you'll excuse the term, uh, of the Supreme Court, it's going to be very, very difficult to fight that on grounds of religious freedom. On the other hand, if we get a Supreme Court that begins to understand that the no establishment provision of the US Constitution is intended to foster the free exercise of religion. If these two are not understood to be a zero sum game in which no establishment necessarily means the decline of free exercise, if no establishment is understood to be the means to the end of free exercise, understood as essential to the formation of civil society and the, sus the sustaining of democracy, then we may be able to have a way to handle the crazy pockets of the country, which are increasingly, uh, which are increasing at a rather alarming rate. Yoram, um, uh, your very eloquent defense of the nation earlier uh, reminds me, of course, that in Europe, while we still have nations, they are increasingly uniform. This is part of the idea of the European Union, is that the differences be ironed out. Uh, a series of supranational courts are constantly imposing new laws and rights on, on these nations. Um, and so, for example, uh, the problem that George mentioned about kosher slaughter and and uh, circumcision, um, these ideas, the banning of them, are creeping in in some countries. And before we know where we are, they will be adopted right across Europe. And, 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 and therefore, Jewish life in Europe will come to an end. Um, that, that is a real danger now. Um, so Yoram, here in Israel, you have a healthy demography, as you pointed out, a successful economy and a society that is rooted in sacred history and family values. Not many societies in the West, certainly not in Europe, uh, can claim as much. So it seems to me Israel must be doing something right. Europeans, however, tend to criticize Israel about every possible shortcoming, real or imagined. Um, we won't even list them all here. You all know them anyway, because you read about them every day <laughs> in your papers. And, see it on TV, um, this non-stop sort of stream of criticism coming from Europe. Um, but if the Europeans were ever to pause in mid-lecture 
and look more carefully at Israel, what do you think they could learn from this country? You've put me in the uh, quite comfortable po position of uh, having you know, a few minutes of carte blanche to lecture back at Europe. Um, and, uh, you I think know. We'd all like to hear that. Make a change. <laughs> I, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to pass up on that, but I, 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 I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Look, it's, it's true. Israel, uh, despite the, uh, uh, the security environment, uh, Israel is doing very, very well right now. And uh, we discussed this at dinner last night, is that it's, you know, for those of us who um, remember Israel 30 years ago, uh, it's, uh, it, it's difficult to imagine, you know, how did we get so, th things to be going so well, we're independent of water, we can take showers as long as we want, you have no idea what that means. We can get telephones, you know, as many telephone lines as you want. You have no idea what that means. Now we have to take them away from our kids. Um, no, it, things, things are going wonderfully in Israel. That doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, that a year from now or five years from now that Israel won't be in some terrible state. So I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to be too condescending about this. Uh, everybody has a lot to learn. To answer your question, um, Europe became, Europe was once um, captivated by the dream of a universal empire. It's a dream that was inherited by, from the Romans, uh, and it's not any different. The, the dream of uh, Roman Empire or Holy Roman Empire that would, would rule the world is at a certain level not any different in principle from the dream that, you know, that the Mongols had or the Assyrians that they should rule the world. It's a fundamental biblical principle that nobody should rule the world. It's bad when somebody rules the world. And if the United Nations or the European Union were to rule the world, it would be terrible for Jews, and it would be terrible for Christians, and it would be terrible for many, many others as well. And so I, I, I think the main thing that I would hope that Israel can contribute to a renewed debate about the future of the West is precisely this. Holland was once a biblical nation, like Israel is. When I say biblical nation, I don't mean that everyone here is religious. We know we're not. But we know that, that uh, the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews have a Passover Seder every year. We know that the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews want their children to be studying Bible in school. And, 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 and that's, that's great. That's what holds us together. That's what anchors us in our past and gives us a vision for what the future could be like. Now, I, I have um, uh, uh, a, gr a group of, of Dutch pastors who come and visit me reg regularly. Every few months, I have uh, an, a, another 40 or 50 Dutch pastors come and see me. And I tell them, you're my heroes. Holland is my heroes. Because in 1581, the Dutch stood up to the uh, uni universal aspirations of the Spanish Empire, of the, the, the uh, of the Habsburg Empire, and in a, 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 a revolution that lasted 80 years, 80 years of fighting, they pulled their people together. How did they do this? They took the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, and they read it, and they said, this is a story about us. Our tribes are disunified, just like the, the, the Jewish tribes were. We're going to make one nation, and we're going to revolt against against the Pharaoh of our day, against the Babylonians of our day. And those, those Dutch who gained independence in 1581 for their way of life, for their, their version of how they wanted to live, they were then the, the, the example for all of Europe. They taught the rest of Europe what it means to be an independent nation. And today, God willing, you know, this message will come to the Middle East and, and we'll get to see the Kurds gain an independent nation and, and, and maybe the Assyrians and maybe the Druze. Freedom of the pe for the peoples. That's what Israel has to teach Europe. I, I, it's sad to say it because Europe, you know, Europe did it better than anyone else for a, a little while. So now maybe it's our turn to give back some of what we've received. Don't, don't go away because I want to ask you a question. Uh, do you think... Europe could hear that message today, or as we've been discussing at least parts of the seminar, uh, is Europe so 
Western Europe in particular, so beset by unprocessed guilt, shame, over the horrors of the 20th century, unable to be expiated because of its secularist turn, uh, that it simply can't hear the message anymore and therefore turns on the messenger. Is that a dynamic of what's going on? Uh, yes, that's, that's exactly the dynamic. For, first of all, I, I don't feel that I'm some great expert on, on, on Europe, but I, I can certainly tell you what these, uh, these, these groups coming to visit me, what they say. And I, I mean, these are, these are very em emotional meetings. Uh, when, when, when we talk about the greatness, you know, the, the greatness of, of the Dutch past and the European past and, and the role of, of, of scripture in creating, uh, creating Holland and what it, what it created in, for the world. These are very emotional meetings. And uh, what I'm told over and over again, some, sometimes people are crying, is that they agree with every word of this message. This is what they believe. And that if they say these words in Europe today, that they will be uh, uh, branded as, as uh, reactionaries or fascists and will not be allowed to open their mouths. And my, my, my great fear today is that the United States is going the same direction. Um, so yes, there's no doubt that you've correctly identified the mechanism. The mechanism is that uh, the Jews learned from the Holocaust, from World War II, uh, a lesson that uh, we, 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 we say never again, and what we, we mean by never again is, is we're never going to allow ourselves to be disarmed again. We're going to fight to save our children uh, in, under any circumstance. That's what we learned from the Holocaust. But what most Germans learned from the Holocaust, they also say never again. It's very funny. They, they have the same slogan. And what they mean is never again will anyone be allowed to have arms to defend themselves because any time that you allow self-determination to defend yourself, then you run the risk of becoming Nazi Germany. And so they see the Jews wanting to defend our children against, uh, uh, to learn the lesson of World War II. They see that as us becoming Nazis and they say so. You know, one of us is right and the other one is kind of crazy. I, you, you know, each one of you can decide which is which. Uh, but that is the mechanism. That's exactly the mechanism and it turns against the United States too. All this talk about the United States being a cowboy nation and, and, and uh, 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 not willing to work under consensus and violating international, all this anti European anti-Americanism, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. They don't want to allow anyone to have the power to do good or right, they want the United Nations to take care of all of it. And we know what that means. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with, with that point about Germany. Uh, you, you said earlier that um, Angela Merkel should go and read her Bible. She is, of course, the daughter of a Lutheran pastor. She shouldn't need to be told to do that. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right that um, opinion polls, German opinion polls of their own people show anything up to half believe that Israel is carrying out a war of extermination against the Palestinians. They actually believe that. Um, you know, this is crazy, as you say. Um, and they think that therefore Israel should not get arms from Europe and, uh, or anyone else. Um, and, and they've disarmed themselves to the point where when Putin threatens from the east, Germany is constantly pressurizing nations that feel threatened, like the Baltic states, the Ukrainians, and so on, um, not to even carry out NATO exercises, you know, not even to sort of prepare for the, the possibility of being attacked, even when they actually are being attacked. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, one on Sorry, yeah. Just one anecdote on that. Um, at about the time that uh, Russia invaded and annexed Crimea, uh, a friend of mine who was monitoring Polish television told me about a uh, program in which uh, two talking heads, uh, one a German foreign policy expert, the other the Polish interviewer. And uh, in response to a question from the poll, the German said, Germany can accept a Russia up to the Polish border, to which the Pole immediately replied, which one? 
<laughs> okay. Um, however, I don't want to make it too easy for our two, our two great uh, interlocutors. So this is a question to both of you, Yoram and George. Our mutual friend, Rabbi Lord Sachs, has argued recently in his book, uh, Not in God's Name, um, which is about religious violence in the 21st century, that the 21st century is already proving to be a period not, as the academic consensus still maintains, of continuing secularization, but actually of desecularization. Now we, in this room, most of us with at least some religious convictions, may welcome this trend. But we are already witnessing wars of religion in the Muslim world that often make a huge impact far beyond that world not least here in Israel. So I think I do have to ask both of you, does all religion, even biblical religion, have the potential to unleash violence, as atheists like to claim? And if so, how can we avoid that trap? How can we, how can we prevent going, us going back to the era of wars of religion? Violence is, is a human thing. Um, I think that in the 20th century we, we, did the, we, we did the experiment where we removed religion from, uh, from uh, being a bone of contention in Europe and we re it immediately replaced itself with, with uh, Bolshevism and Nazism and fascism. And I think they did a pretty good job of being violent without the help of religion. Um, uh, by the way, in the, the, the Chinese also you know, this is, this is a multicultural experiment. The Chinese also succeeded in killing 50 million of their own people without the benefit of religion. So I, I don't accept that wars are waged for religion. I think that wars are waged because human beings are bad and they don't like to make peace with one another. And when somebody has something that you think you want or, or need, then you get scared and you, you beat them up, and sometimes that is, you do much worse than that. So um, I think the first step is to give up on uh, what I think is really just a piece, of, uh, uh, a piece of malicious propaganda, that war, which is fundamental to the human condition everywhere, is fought for religion. War is not fought for religion. It's fought for other reasons. Even the Iranians and the Saudis, uh, who are fighting a pretty darn good example of a religious war are not fighting a religious war that if you took away their, their religious disagreements, they'd still be scared, scared of one another. I, I, I tend to agree with Rabbi Sachs that, you know, I, he's, he's, he's wonderfully eloquent on this subject. And I, I certainly agree that religion has a positive role to play. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that the appropriate way for religions to, um, to approach peacemaking among religions, which I think is a highly desirable thing, is to get all the religions in the room and for everybody to, to sort of um, warm up to one another because all religions are equal. All religions are not equal. And uh, the, uh, the issues that divide Christians and Jews to this day uh, the wounds that need to be healed between Christians and Jews are not the same as the wounds that, uh, that uh, defied uh, Hindus, and, Hindus and Jews. It's a completely different thing. In fact, there may be no such wounds at all. Um, and so I would like to see a, um, a focusing on what religions can share, uh, which is not forced into the sort of Rousseauian framework of everybody has to be equal because we're all religions. I, I think this is simply false. I think that um, the number one goal for the, the coming decades for Jews and Christians is to see whether it's not possible to uh, create an alliance of Jews and Christians um, in, in those religious and political matters and moral matters in which we agree. And if we're capable of doing that, then we can bring others in as well. Uh, but I would, I would want to focus attention on that. Uh, here in Israel, we obviously have to focus attention on our relationship with, uh, uh, with the Muslim world. But uh, to be quite frank, at the moment, there is not a very great interest in that. So we're, 
waiting for the time that that might be possible, as it is with our Christian friends. Uh, just, just two thoughts on that. Um, it seems to me that um, Bernard Lewis, uh, Fouad Ajami, the late Fouad Ajami, who was a, a dear friend, uh, are quite right in describing the present contestation with jihadist Islam as uh, something that began with an intra-Islamic war, civil war, if you will, over how to cope with modernity, uh, which many forms of Islam don't do too well, that has now spilled over uh, into a jihadist uh, war against the perceived masters of modernity, namely uh, those who constitute the West. Uh, and under those conditions, I agree that there is not going to be a whole lot of useful conversation about ordering the global public uh, square until it is made clear that the West is prepared to defend itself uh, against uh, this assault. Now, we talk about interreligious dialogue as if it were limited to we often talk about interreligious dialogue as if it were limited to how do we approach sacred texts with modern methods, how do we relate faith and reason, how do we understand uh, certain convictions uh, that are shared uh, among uh, Jews and Christians. Let me suggest that another useful field uh, to uh, explore in that ongoing and critical conversation uh, has to do with uh, just war theory, uh, with a mutual exploration of what are the conditions under the which the resort to armed force is not only morally permissible but morally obligatory, uh, and then something in which I think Israel has perhaps more uh, existential experience than any other state in the world today, how do, how do we conduct ourselves in situations of armed conflict so that we don't uh, violate the moral convictions and uh, the convictions about human dignity that we are uh, defending. Uh, this is a terribly important conversation. I don't think there are going to be a whole lot of people in Europe interested in engaging it for the reasons that were said a moment ago. Uh, but I think it's a very important American-Israeli-Christian-Jewish conversation that ought to get going sooner uh, rather than uh, later uh, because these, uh, these questions are not going to go away. Uh, and we already see uh, what happens when there isn't uh, a sufficient public foundation uh, in the United States, for example, uh, for the use of... Uh, uh, of armed force, uh, we bail out. And uh, as we all know, a lot of bad things happen when that uh, happens. I'm going to throw open the discussion to the floor now. I grew up in Switzerland, in Geneva, and I'm 40 now, so you know, I grew up in the 80s there, 90s, and it was you know, quite a homogeneous, white Christian society. And uh, I go there every, you know, every so often to see family and friends. And I, I'm struck by how much it has changed in just a very short amount of time. Like Switzerland of uh, today, France and all, you know, Europe is, is really very different. I mean, soci sociologically speaking, than it used to be just 20 years ago. That, that's my feeling. And, um, and the question is, is it not too late already? I think maybe we'll take one other question first. Um, sir, you, you, you want to speak? You've pointed some of, some of the maladies in Western society, both of you, and you attributed them to the decline in Judeo-Christian values quite directly. Um, now, I will agree with you that historically, by default, the, the set of values that brought humanism and democracy and the rule of law to, to Europe and Western society in general was the Judeo-Christian set of values. But don't you think it's a case to be made that it is the only set of values that can 
keep them going. I mean, um, it, it's not axiomatic, I and mean, both of you kind of agreed on it tacitly. Uh, but I think I would make two points to you. First of all, it is not, to my opinion, the only, uh, the only worldview that can maintain uh, a society to keep a birth rate uh, high, and it's kind of instinct of survival not to let immigration uh, wash it. And second, I think that you're kind of setting yourself up for failure if you're speaking to um, a West that is already, I don't know, uh, statistics, but tens of millions of atheists who do not see themselves in, in believing in God uh, and to make contingent, um, you know, the set of values that the Bible represents on a belief in God is, I think, is kind of passé in a lot of uh, the societies that you're trying to bring back to health. So that's the two points I want to make. Okay, so basically we've got, is it too late? And does it matter anyway? Is this the only, the only kind of values you can have? So Joram, do you want to start? I, I was taking this, uh, this course on Soviet politics as an undergraduate 30 years ago. 800 students per semester took this course. And uh, this man was witty, this man was brilliant. And he and his entire profession, right, just, just you know, with, I, I'm talking about I was listening to him explaining the eternity and success of the Soviet model um, just five years before it disappeared, you know, with maybe 200 bullets being fired, um, perhaps forever. His entire profession missed it. There was not a single Sovietologist, a single paid human being uh, who, who spent his time studying the Soviet Union who understood what was about to happen. I, I see Max shaking his head. Was, what? Okay, there, there was one. And, and Bob Conquest, too. There were two. <laughs> and uh, I, I, hope you, I hope you understand my point. We, we, don't, we don't know what's going to happen. What we know is, um, we know we can look at history and see what works. If you want to come up with a different model to propose instead of uh, 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 Judaism or Christianity, I'm willing to consider it. We, we, one thing we know is we know what works. The other thing that we know is that this is not in our control. I mean, each and every one of us, we have to do certain things. What do we have to do? Uh, I, on a personal level, uh, if we have the ability to start studying our studying Torah, studying our tradition, then we should do it. It's the source of all of our strength. Uh, by the way, Ariel Sharon used to say this all the time, as did many of the other la labor leaders. Uh, the Jews didn't keep Shabbat. Shabbat kept the Jews. So we should keep Shabbat, and we should keep our traditions. And on the more general level, we need to start talking about a politics. What would a politics look like that was not based only on liberalism? And I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem with what you're saying is it's, it's, you're absolutely right that Europe and America are going in a certain direction. But why are they going in a certain direction? At least part of the answer is because religious people are not answering the question. It's not, it's not as though you, you can, who, who is the, re, who's the religious response to John Rawls? Right? I mean, I, I can, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, George can name a couple of people and I can name a couple of people also, but, but as, as a serious organized effort to re, rethink Western civilization on the basis of a neo-biblical model, a, a, a new religious model. We're not going back. We're not going back to the Middle Ages. We're going to have to go forward. But the model is going to have to be different because we can see that what we have is failing. So, so when are we going to do this? I, I, we can't promise success. All we know is that we don't have any choice. So we have to do this. We have to begin to do the work both at a personal level and at, 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 uh, at a national level, at the level of, of ideas and at the level of thoughts and the ideas of books. And, uh, and uh, you know, we should have a little bit of trust. Uh, if we do the right thing, then God will help us too, including those who don't believe in him. Israel has proved that. Very briefly, uh, is it too late uh, for Europe? Um, I have to confess that I am more uh, pessimistic uh, about Western Europe in particular uh, than I was 14 or 15 years ago when I first began thinking about this in the ways that led to the book uh, that has been referred to, The Cube and the Cathedral. Uh, because I don't see a lot of uh, forward progress, as we say in American football, uh, on dealing with what seemed to me uh, the grave uh, moral, cultural, or civilizational morale problems that underlie 
uh, Europe's increasing uh, fecklessness and worse uh, politically. Uh, on the other hand, I completely uh, agree that one has to be open uh, to the possibility of dramatic uh, change uh, in history. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow uh, briefly in our seminar is that anyone looking at the <clears throat> condition of the Catholic Church in France in, say, 1805, uh, after the first 20 years of the uh, uh, first 15 years of the French Revolution would say this is a finished enterprise. They are done. Uh, and yet there was this enormous uh, renaissance of French Catholic life throughout the 19th century, that uh, the effects of which we still see today uh, in the dramatic uh, Christianization of sub-Saharan Africa, which conceivably could produce the next pope. Uh, nobody would predicted any of that in 1805. Uh, 1989, and what made 1989 possible? Uh, this remarkable coalition of secular and religious people in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere, who could have predicted the election of a Polish pope who would ignite the tinder that was already there in Central and Eastern Europe and create a revolution of conscience among people who had been told for 40 years that the only conscience available publicly was the uh, Central Committee of the, of the Communist Party. Um, so I'm open to the possibility of surprises. Uh, the United States has been through, depending on how you count this up, uh, three, four, or five great awakenings in the course of 300 plus years of colonial and then independent uh, history. Uh, that's possible again. Uh, in the United States. It's time. Yeah, it's about time. Uh, we you know, we, unfortunately, we can't order these things up like, uh, you know, burgers at McDonald's, but uh, uh, actually, it's probably just as well that we can't order them up like burgers at McDonald's. Uh, but it is about time, and I sense in the young people I encounter on campuses uh, today from, you know, the Ivy League to big state universities to uh, smaller boutique religious schools, um, a restlessness that can only be described as spiritual in character and a willingness, unlike many of their parents, to look to biblical religion as a means to uh, address that restlessness. Is, is the Judeo-Christian tradition the only possibility? I mean, theoretically, no. I mean, I could do a thought experiment in which I can imagine a polity of, of decent human beings steeped in Aristotelian virtue ethics, uh, uh, fully conversant with classic democratic theory, uh, conducting themselves in, a, uh, in an honorable uh, and noble way. Uh, but I don't see any large-scale possibility of that today. I think that may be possible in micro-communities uh, today. Uh, you may even find that uh, in a big place like the United States, which is, I have to constantly remind my British in-laws, is a continent, not a country. Uh, it's as far from Seattle to Washington, D.C. as it is from Dublin to Kiev. Uh, a fact that Europeans really don't understand. In those 330 million people, uh, there may be the emergence of uh, local or state level uh, micro communities of, of civic renewal. Uh, one could imagine that happening, but I don't, I don't see any place where that could happen beyond the kind of micro uh, scale. Uh, in part because, as we've discussed in our seminar, uh, unfortunately, what we used to call political science in the West has lost its connection to classical political theory. Political science in most Western universities is now a subset of statistics. It's a numbers crunching game. Uh, now, there are obviously exceptions to that, and we all know where they are. Uh, but the main drift is not towards thinking the great thoughts about what makes 
for a just and noble and satisfying common life. Uh, and secondly, because, and I don't mean here simply to instrumentalize biblical religion, but for most human beings, weak and prone to doing bad stuff uh, as we are, uh, the idea God wants me to behave this way is a shorter route to decency than Aristotle's ethics. It's just a shorter route to decency. Now, you may want to fill that out over time. You may want to marry the two, as, as I certainly would want to do, as Thomas Aquinas did. Isn't that the whole faith in humanity, though? That's only a, a, a divine being can be a source of the world? No, I think it's, no, I didn't say that's the only way. I said that's the shortest way. That's the easiest way. Um, and in fact, I think the experience of the United States is that America has become a remarkably tolerant political community, not out of a deep, widespread public knowledge of John Locke, but out of the conviction, God wants me to be tolerant of people, God wills me to be tolerant, of people who have a different understanding of the will of God than I do. I think that's just the empirical fact. Thank you. Um, I've got Yigal and, and uh, Sam, yes. Um, Three or four very brief points. Uh, there was a recent decision of an appeal court in France uh, saying that uh, you can't put a crash in a public place. It might sound familiar. Laïcité is still uh, rampant in France. Uh, and uh, that's a good indication of what's going on there. It may be significant also that there are six Catholics and three Jews on the United States Supreme Court and no Protestants, and nevertheless they're doing what they're doing. Uh, perhaps uh, somebody could comment on that. Um, do we have anything to learn from Eastern religious traditions? Should we not be looking at Buddhism and Hinduism and see if they've got more in common with us than jihadism? Uh, Israel is a tiny country. We have our borders. We have no territorial expansionist ideas. We don't want to convert anybody to Judaism. Uh, th those are big differences. But I think those should be addressed as well. I'm very appreciative of uh, the last words of uh, George Wegel, but uh, I, because they appear in our writings by Rav Sadia Gaon many, many thousand year ago, years ago, but I would like to point out two things, or perhaps only one. Firstly, uh, we seem to claim that returning to the Bible may uh, reawaken values that are forgotten. However, there is also a danger. How do we make sure that we read the Bible correctly? That is, uh, uh, withhold, uh, um, helping along yeah, right. the right values. Secondly, this all, and, but this is something else altogether. Um, it appears that we give an instrumental uh, role to the Bible and to religion. However, religion is quite more than that. Religion is also about the dialogue between man and God, about uh, other things that we do. So this seems to ignore at least half of what religion should mean. So these are some two points. A couple, couple of points on that, on both questions. Um, uh, six Catholics and three Jews on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, that is viewed sociologically or socio-historically <clears throat> an example of successful assimilation. Um, uh, of Irish Americans, Italian Americans, African Americans, uh, etc., and uh, and Jewish uh, Americans from a variety of of national backgrounds. <clears throat> However, um, I speak with a certain certainty that two of the six Catholics are best described as vestigial. Uh, in their Catholicism. It's like a chemical trace that you find after, uh, if you look very hard. And I don't see any indication that Justices Breyer, Ginsburg, or Kagan 
uh, are anything other than committed to the expressive individualist project, which all three of them not only endorsed, but um, in, in the Obergefell decision, written by one of the vestigial Catholics, um, uh, Tony Kennedy, but seemed weirdly happy to leave it with his kind of airy-fairy logic, which if you are interested in reading intellectual demolition derby projects, I invite you to read Justice Scalia's dissent on Kennedy's Obergefell decision. I mean, you really need the dental records to identify the remains at the end of, of that exercise. Um, reading the Bible well. Um, I don't wish to add any more burdens to clergy, uh, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, uh, but if we are in this degree of civilizational Soros, uh, trouble, uh, that there seems to be some agreement on, uh, then surely one of the things that effective teaching and preaching uh, ought to do is to help people of faith learn to see the world through a biblical lens. Uh, I was describing this, I was discussing this with uh, who the other day? It might have been uh, Yehoshua, it might have been somebody else. I said, you know, the state of preaching in the Catholic Church is frankly abysmal. Uh, at its best, it's a kind of high moral exhortation. But the notion that the job of the preacher is to break open the biblical text, to explicate it, so that people learn to live inside it, so that it's not heteronymous. It's, it's part of the way we see the world. Uh, it's the formative way we see the world. It's not a well-developed talent, uh, certainly in the Christian communities that I'm most familiar with. So that's, uh, that's where I think that's going to happen, is in worship and uh, study. Uh, I certainly do not mean to instrumentalize uh, religious conviction. Um, I'm very clear in terms of my own identity. Uh, I am a Catholic Christian first, an American second, uh, a Baltimore Orioles fan third. Um, that's a baseball team for those of you who don't understand that God invented baseball. And, um, you know, a, a Western Democratic committed defender of the project, you know, somewhere along the line. But, I have, you know, had the opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time with a lot of religious people, Jewish, Catholic, uh, Protestant, who have married these various levels of identity uh, in a very powerful way. And then I had the extraordinary privilege of spending 13 years in active conversation with John Paul II. Uh, which was uh, three graduate educations in itself, and then trying to explicate his thought for a world audience in 1,500 pages of two volumes of biography was an attempt precisely to de-instrumentalize religious conviction and show how the animation of lives uh, and consciences for those whose first commitment is to be faithful to the God of the Bible, uh, can have transformative effects in history. Um, Joram, would you like to say a few words? But we're, just before you do, we're, we're coming towards the end of the evening. Um, and if there is anyone else who is, has a burning question that they simply have to, have to get out. Ah, yes, I can see you. OK. Um, <laughs> Your, um, I, think, I think your daughter might, might, might have something she wants to say. I was taught that at lectures I should ask questions and not make comments, so I'll ask a question to Professor Weigel if I can. I want to take us back to the separation of church and state um, and to what you mentioned about public schools. You said that the money could come from the government, but we could privatize what is taught in schools. But then you reserved that by saying, well, actually, we still would have to have some kind of requirement of what is taught in these different schools that we're giving public money to. So I wanted to ask you, 
Do you think there could be other values other than equality and freedom that could be shared by the American people that they would be willing to give their government funds to? Other values other than those two? And if so, what would be the texts or the role models that you would use to teach children in these public schools? Because I think that talking about education in a very theoretical way doesn't really help us figure out what are these values that we think that we could have in common. Okay, so I'm going to ask both, both our speakers to give some sort of final comments and perhaps incorporate an answer to that. Defer to the older tradition to uh, wrap up here. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to be clear on, on what I was saying, which I evidently wasn't uh, before. I was talking about minimal educational standards that would be uh, expected, whether the school in question was a Quaker school or a Catholic school or a Jewish day school uh, or a government-run uh, secular school, although I would hope that the pluralization of American elementary and secondary education would gradually reduce the role of the state in the education business, which I don't think, based on uh, the past 40 years of experience in the US, it does particularly well. And I'm talking about you know, minimal literacy standards, math skills, science knowledge, et cetera. Um, what would be the moral formation, the human formation, in those schools which are not religiously grounded? Uh, I'm not sure what the answer would be to that today uh, because the common moral culture has so uh, deteriorated uh, that the question of getting agreement on uh, what would be a, mor a values curriculum, an ethics curriculum, would be very difficult to come by. Once you, once you get past the, <laughs> the very generic notion, notion, people should be nice to each other. Uh, it's hard to see where, where you would go. Um, which is why I think we have to demonopolize uh, elementary and secondary education, because the state schools are simply not going to provide uh, that kind of character formation uh, when they can't even teach math, science, and reading skills uh, properly, as they manifestly cannot do when you measure American test scores against other students uh, from around the world. Um, my last word, that's probably not a particularly good answer, but it's the things that come to mind right now. Um, last word for the evening is simply to say that I am very happy to see evolving here under the leadership of Tikva, Yehoshua, uh, Yoram, and allied parties, uh, the kind of high-level discussion of uh, religion and society uh, in a non-instrumental way that has gotten past these shibboleths that impede this discussion in Europe and in significant parts of the United States today. I think this is an enormously positive sign for Israel. Uh, it makes me feel even more at home here than I've felt from the beginning, which I've always felt, uh, that this was a kindred uh, political community. Uh, and I hope that there can be, over time, some very fruitful uh, conversation uh, between what may turn out to be all due respects to the United Kingdom, the two pillars of the democratic experiment in the 21st century, namely Israel and the United States. There was a question about how to, how do we make sure that we're interpreting the Bible in a reasonable way, and there was a question about uh, um, really people aren't so interested in God anymore, and I, I actually think that these are, these are very similar questions. Um, we Jews are Absolutely. I mean, I, anybody wants to, please just um, uh, be offended. It's okay. It's just true. We Jews are absolutely abysmal, abysmal at talking 
to the world, talking to the public about the things that we Jews believe. Now just, just do a thought experiment for a moment. How many people, how many Jews can you think of who are, who would classify, who would qualify as being a significant public figure who, ex who, who bothers to spend his or her time uh, explaining the Jewish God or the Jewish Bible or the Jewish tradition, Torah, to uh, mass media, in bestsellers, in, on television, radio, movies. Who, who is there? So, okay, so there's Rabbi Sachs. How many times can we mention him in one evening? God bless him, he's terrific, he's the best. He should live to be 300 years old and he should keep doing it. But, you know, maybe we could use a second or a third. All right, so maybe there are a couple others that I'm missing. But surely you understand the problem. The problem is that th there's, there's, there's two kinds of, of Jews who deal in, in ideas. There's uh, the yeshiva world, the orthodox yeshiva world, which is overwhelmingly turned in on itself. Uh, there's wonderful things in there. Uh, 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 an ocean of Torah, wonderful things. It speaks to itself. It doesn't speak to the overwhelming majority of Jews, much, much less to the, the rest of the world that's waiting to hear what do the Jews have to say. And then we have Jewish academics. And Jewish academics do not believe that their, uh, that, uh, that their academic disciplines uh, mandate, empower, or, uh, empower them or give them a responsibility in exchange for tenure to teach about the Jewish God in a way that somebody could accept it or believe it or think it was a good idea or consider it. And they, they're not empowered or, or mandated to teach Torah, Jewish ideas, in a way that somebody could. Now you can, I, I could probably name five exceptions. Maybe I could get up to ten. I'm talking about in the entire academic world. We're talking about tens of thousands of people who at one way or another are involved in teaching about Judaism. And yet they don't think that their mission is to say anything constructive and attractive to the young people who sit in front of them. They think their mission is, is, is basically to, uh, uh, to, to uh, 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 write the histories of things that happened in micro locations hundreds of years ago. Now each and every single person who is within earshot of this atrocious condition should understand the following thing. It's true that in the West, belief in God is declining, respect for the Torah, respect for Judaism, respect for the, for the Bible is declining. That's all true. But what I want to know is, what are you doing to turn it around? What are you doing? Because you could be doing something. There's a hundred million people, a hundred million people, I'm just throwing out a number, maybe it's more, out there who, yes, they're confused. They don't know what they think about God anymore. But I'll, 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 I'll tell you something. My experience with speaking to these, these, these audiences in, in, in America and Europe and Israel, my experience is that overwhelmingly the young generation is not militantly atheist. They're not militantly anti-Torah. They're not militantly anti-Bible or religion. They're just confused. They just, they've just heard that the Bible is, a, is in many ways a terrible book and that God is in many ways a terrible idea and they've never really thought about it terribly deeply. They talk about it to their friends much, some, and they're willing, they're willing, they're interested in discussing it. Who is there to talk to? Right, so the, the, problem, the problem is not with our, our, our youth who are drifting away because they're so sure that the past has nothing to offer them. The problem is with our intellectual leadership, which is not stepping up to the plate. Neither the yeshiva world nor the academics. There's a whole world of people who want to hear what the Jews have to say. Jews and Christians, and, and people who are not Jews and Christians. A whole world, and we're just not saying anything. And I'll just leave you with one, one last comment about this. Our prophets, the prophets of Israel, the Israel, this, you know, they disagree about so many things. They're Jews. They disagree about so many things, but there's some things that they don't disagree about. Here's one of the things that they don't disagree about, that the ideal for a Jew should be that, that Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, should become a place to which all nations of the word all nations of the world turn and they say, come, let's go. Let's go to, to, to hear what God has to say, what the Jews have to say. That's an ideal in, in Isaiah, in Ishayahu, in Yirmiyahu, 
in, 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 in Zechariah, in Yechezkel, Moshe Rabbeinu even talks about it. It's, it's just the Jewish ideal. And we talk all about you know, making the desert bloom. That's great, I love the desert, let's make it bloom. It's terrific. But how about the intellectual desert that we're doing nothing to make it bloom? Thank you.